So uh, hi, Randy. How are you? Good. Happy to be with you. Uh, I'm Randy Ellis. I'm a postdoc in Michael Levin's lab. Uh, I'm working on cellular communication and collective decision making. Um, and uh, I did my PhD at Mount Sinai in the lab of Dr. Yasmin Hurd on opioid addiction. Um, but yeah, mm. happy to talk to you today. Yeah, awesome. Um, in thinking about where to start, like sort of um, with questions, I mean, one, th one thing it would be helpful if you elaborate on and 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 talk about which is in Michael Levin's lab. It kind of we're kind of looking at one thing is how intelligence can sort of come about beyond just the brain, right? So you know it can be in, for example, ant colonies, and it, you know we could have intelligent behavior, say with single cells, with limbs, with embryos. So I was wondering, you know. What do you think of that work and what implications does it have for what we think of, you know, as intelligence and 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 what human intelligence sort of means in that context? Yeah, no, it's a great uh, set of questions. But I, I think the sort of crux of what uh, Mike in the lab try to get at is what kinds of competencies manifest mm. at different scales of biology. So mm. like you mentioned an ant colony. Individual ants have about a quarter million neurons in their brain, but an ant colony as a collective does very complex things that certainly no individual ant could do by themselves. So you can think about what kinds of competencies arise uh, from collectives of individual organisms. You can think about what kinds of competencies arise from tissues within an individual organism. And then if you scale all the way down, you can look at the kinds of things that single celled organisms can do. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the things that we try to assess in at all these different levels are things like learning or memory or adaptation uh, and communication and things like that. And um, it raises a lot of questions in terms of foundational assumptions. So one of many that the lab sort of questions, you know, from different angles is learning and memory. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk to neuroscientists and uh, I'd say most biologists in general, learning is synaptic. You need neurons and you need synapses and memories are stored within synapses and uh, they're activated and um, deactivated synaptically, you know, based on the context and uh, stimuli and reinforcement and all these sorts of things. Well, one of the things that uh, the lab and other labs, you know, scattered around the world um, try to do is look at learning and memory in organisms that do not have nervous systems. They don't have any neurons. So these could be things like paramecia, which are uh, single celled organisms that have these little hair like structures called cilia. It's part of a group of organisms known as the ciliates. Uh, there are things like slime molds, uh, you know, a, the one genus of them is called Physarum. So there's Physarum polycephalum. There are other species of Physarum, but uh, people have done pretty sophisticated and very interesting experiments where they exhibit very rudimentary forms of learning like habituation or sensitization. And mm. they can uh, navigate mazes and generally solve problems. So like when we talk about competencies, it's more like what does the organism control? What does it predict? What problems does it solve for itself and its own sustenance, survival, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, it, it gets really interesting because there are many different model organisms that people use these days. So, uh, you know, I mentioned slime molds, but another one that is being worked on um, by labs at UCSF and Harvard, and I think a couple of other places, is uh, Stentor. So Stentor mm -hmm. is this little unicellular organism. It's big enough to see with the naked eye. It kind of looks like a, like a horned instrument kind of, but people have done really cool experiments showing that it can habituate. And habituation, you know, just to be clear, is just, you know, a decrease in the magnitude of a response upon repeated stimulation. So you can almost sort of think of it like, like tolerance to drugs. I'm using that analogy because of my PhD research. I studied mm -hmm. addiction. But like when someone takes a drug, you know, many, many times uh, over a short time period, the effects of the drugs will decrease. They'll become tolerant to it. So drug tolerance is just one form of habituation, which is habituating to some kind of stimulus. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're seeing habituation in a single celled organism, you have to ask the question, how does that happen? Like what's mm -hmm. the biological substrate for that? What kind of processing internally enables that kind of learning? And people can fight over the definitions of words. You know, is it learning? Is it adaptation? Is there agency or cognition involved? And things can get very dicey when it comes to the definitions. But the point is, is that there are many different organisms and lines of research using them that demonstrate some pretty complex behaviors happening. And without a nervous system, you got to ask, how does that happen? And so those are the kinds of questions that uh, my mm -hmm. lab and other labs uh, try to get at. Yeah, no, that, that's really good, especially because my question was very like high level. So that's a nice way into it. Well, one thing that I want to touch on there might be even to expand upon your what we mean and what Michael Levin's work means for what memory is right so from what my limited understanding like say in our brain it's kind of even a tricky issue about what we mean you know by where memories are stored right and I know in I guess in a single like a, a multicellular organism like us we kind of have, seem to have more complex memories right um whereas whereas you could say maybe habituation, maybe these more simple learned responses are also a kind of memory. I don't know if that's enough, like if you we want to start there, but kind of what memory is. Absolutely. So one, people fight about this all the time. So what I'm going to say is certainly not anything universal and plenty of people will disagree with me. Um, but I think a very basic way to think about memory is it's a change in behavior as a result of prior experience. So like what we were just saying with habituation, and habituation is a very basic form of learning. So you do something over and over again, or you're given some stimulus over and over again, and the response declines. And the response declines um, because that response is decreasing. It's decreasing in response to repeated experience. Um, and people can fight over like any of the words in that sentence. You can fight over what experiences, you can fight over um, decline, um, all, because uh, uh, people often question um, the kinds of controls that people do. So for example, mm -hmm. stentor, single celled organism, people did these very basic experiments where you just poke it, you know, they call it mechanical stimulation, because it has to be something polysyllabic or else it's not interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you can poke this thing over and over again, and it has a withdrawal response and avoidance response. And um people can say like, oh, like maybe the habituation is happening because it's uh, tired or it's metabolically depleted. And those are always important questions. And you have to run control experiments to make sure that it isn't those things mm -hmm. causing what you're observing. Uh, but people have done sophisticated experiments and ran the controls and they found that those kinds of factors cannot explain the habituation response. And in fact, uh, some work that came out a few years ago from uh, Jeremy Gunawardena's lab at Harvard, they found this complex hierarchy of avoidance behaviors in stentor um, when they're given repeated stimulation. So it even goes beyond like just simple habituation of one kind of response to one kind of stimulus. And that work actually... Um, sort of uh, resurrected a line of research that was first uh, done in the early 1900s. So there was a biologist, his name was Herbert Spencer Jennings, and he worked with Stentor in like 1906, you know, all the way back there. And a lot of people didn't believe it. You know, this is sort of when uh, behaviorism was sort of coming into mm -hmm. fashion in uh, the United States. So where, you know, really everything is just stimulus and reinforcement. The only thing that uh, causes behavior is what they experience from outside of them. And internal structure doesn't matter very much. But getting back to the, to the point of the matter is that um, Jennings did these experiments with Stentor. A lot of people didn't believe them. People tried to replicate them and they failed. They couldn't replicate his original results. It turned out that the people failing to replicate his experiments were using a different species of stentor called a stentor 
ceruleus, and he was using a species mm-hmm. called Stentor rosalie. Um, but this lab at Harvard, uh, a few years ago, they published this data, you know, using the correct species of Stentor. And they not only replicated some of Jennings's work, but they built on top of it. And that was how they discovered this, uh, what they call a complex hierarchy of avoidance responses, which is just absolutely fascinating. And it opens up all kinds of questions. Right. So, you know, like, a. Uh... To see if I my understanding is correct. So with this, like, say, single-celled organism, were they kind of again? It gets back to memory. Were they kind of finding that it couldn't just be this behaviorist, like, stimulus response because it had again? I know the the the, the, the whole tricky question is what memory is, but it, it had this kind of more complex. Is that right? Am I right in saying that? So it was more complex. Uh, so we were thinking it's go get. No, it's it's a very it's a very good question because um. The behaviorist framework of, you know, stimulus response, you know, you reward a response and then, you know, you reward and you reinforce the behavior. So the behavior continues. Mm -hmm. But a key part of the framework of behaviorism is heavy in learning, which is the basic idea of neurons that fire together, wire together. So behaviorism sort of, you know, started out as a purely psychological and behavioral framework of just stimulus response. Mm -hmm. But people forget that Donald Hebb, who coined Hebb and learning as a neuroscientist, you know, he was very much involved in the behaviorist wave, so to speak, in the mid 20th century. So I think behaviorists would assume that stimulus response learning would require neurons. Uh-huh. That's what so if you're saying if it is just stimulus response, you're still talking about an organism implementing mm-hmm. it that doesn't have any neurons. Right. And I think, you know, like since, you know, the 50s with the cognitive revolution, I think everybody understands that internal structure matters. So if Stentor is engaging in these responses, you know, based on stimulus, sure, wonderful, that's fantastic. And if the responses follow the kinds of stimulus response curves that B.F. Skinner and others would like do on pigeons and pigs and stuff, you know, in the 30s and 40s and stuff, that's all wonderful. But the question is, what's the biology? What is the internal structure of Stentor that enables it to do these things? Because it sure as heck ain't neurons and synapses. It doesn't have any. Mm -hmm. on the question of like again interesting things we're finding and also related to memory michael michael levin's done work on bioelectric sort of networks and these other kinds of ways where there's memory say beyond just dna i don't know if like you could explain that and and i wonder if, if that if that links in any relevant way to what we're talking about here absolutely um so people talk about like, okay, if the substrate of learning and memory is not necessarily neurons and synapses for all organisms, what is it instead? Mm -hmm. And so there are two um, lines of research and perspectives that we sort of, you know, uh, use in the lab to get at this question. One is that the substrate of memory is molecular. It's things like DNA, RNA, histone modifications, things like that. And uh, that actually has a very interesting history. So people did a lot of really cool experiments in the 60s and 70s where they would train an animal to do something and they would take RNA from that animal and then they would stick it into a naive animal and they would claim that the naive animal who received the RNA from the trained animal would exhibit the same trained response. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of this stuff was done in the late 60s and early 70s, and people tried to replicate it. They couldn't. Um, But this stuff has sort of um, come back, uh, you know, I think in a very strong way in the past five or so years um, with newer, higher resolution genetic technologies. And so One of my favorite examples uh, comes from a lab at UCLA uh, led by David Glansman. So uh, in this study, he was working with aplesia, which are sea slugs. And sea slugs have neurons, but but that's not really the point. Um, Basically, uh, they would train aplesia to withdraw their tails. And 
they basically had these little probes installed in their tails and they would do this uh, pretest just to see how they would respond, you know, normally and, you know, sort of like poke them and then they withdraw, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so what they did is they used a protocol to sensitize this response where they would withdraw the tail and then keep it withdrawn for like 40 to 60 seconds. And the way that you train a sea slug to keep its tail withdrawn mm -hmm. is um, to deliver uh, small voltage shocks to it on like a timed schedule. So this is sensitization training for tail withdrawal by administering small uh, bursts of electricity, essentially. Mm -hmm. So after the training, you can then uh, do the same like tail poking and then you can measure how long they keep the tail withdrawn and so sea slugs that go through this electric shock training process they keep their tails withdrawn for quite a long time like 40 to 60 seconds now the where it gets interesting is they took a sea slug that went through this training protocol they took rna from that sea slug and then they deposit it into a sea slug that's naive, that hasn't gone through any of this training at all with the electric shocks at all. And they compared it to sea slugs that don't have any training, but also didn't get any RNA. So it's all naive sea slugs. It's just that these sea slugs are just regular old sea slugs. And these sea slugs have RNA from sea slugs that went through this training protocol with mm -hmm. the shocks. And the ones that got the RNA from the trained sea slugs withdrew their tails for like 40 or 50 seconds so it's kind of you know again resurrecting old research this is like a 50 year gap um but using these really sophisticated technologies you know they were able to show that perhaps you can transport a learned response, you know, I'm, I'm calling it a learned response just to not call it a memory, but right. you know, it is a learned response that seems to have been transported by RNA. And then they built on that by getting at the mechanism. So they use this drug um, called DNMT that inhibits uh, methylation. It's a specific kind of epigenetic modification. And when they gave this drug, they blocked the learned response. So, mm you know, in biology, everything is so complex. So, I mean, if you give a drug to block something and that leads to some behavioral result, you don't know if it's purely the thing that you blocked or one of the 10 million things that happen between blocking the one thing and the behavior you're interested right. in. Um, but nevertheless, you know, this is a, this is a hypothesis that is now gaining more traction, you know, that RNA or macromolecules, DNA, RNA, chromatin, uh, so on and so forth, could be a substrate of memory. Now, that's the molecular mm -hmm. idea. Next to that, uh, which uh, the lab is very much inter interested in, is bioelectricity. And bioelectricity is sort of like the ancestor of neuronal activity. So neurons, they operate on very short time scales. They're very fast. Uh, they're very efficient. You know, the machinery is very complex. You know, they use ion channels. They use uh, neurotransmitters. They use, uh, uh, you know, all different sorts of ways for communication and support and uh, structural, um, structural robustness and all these sorts of things. But bioelectricity just is sort of like the ancestor of all of this. So bioelectricity, for example, like ionic communication, mm -hmm. all of that is on very short time scales. All of that is very efficient. It's metabolically optimized. And ion channel communication, bioelectricity occurs in virtually all biological life. So, you know, it's, I think, in my view, very false to sort of draw this line between nervous systems and non-nervous systems because it's a lot more continuous than it is discrete okay certainly there are things that um animals with complex nervous systems can do that ones with simple nervous systems can't so like an ant i mean an ant can actually do a lot of very complex things i don't know how the hell ants do what they do they know the position of the sun they remember where food sources are they obviously communicate with their colony in all sorts of ways there are social hierarchies all of that stuff is mind-blowing but, you know, I don't know if an ant thinks about like 
starting a family in like 10 or 20 years or like what their job prospects are like in the colony. You know, those are things that humans do. Um, I don't know if a dog thinks about where it's going to play three months from now. Um, but you could probably take a guess and think that they don't have those thoughts or ideas. Um, but people can argue about that as well. Um, but yeah, bioelectricity, um, sort of a sort of an ancestor of neuronal activity, and then the sort of macro molecular substrate of memory. Those are sort of two perspectives that we wrestle with a lot. Okay, so the, we can get we can get more into that. But like, to help me understand that, when you say that it's sort of a primitive form, say of the kinds of nervous systems that we like in our own nervous system, say with neurons, right? There is like electricity and electrical signals go on anyway. So for example, when Michael Levin's lab works on like paramecium, they don't have like neurons and nervous systems, but are they then arguing that there is still nevertheless like some bioelectricity that is like doing work and seemingly like perhaps storing memories of a kind? Am I right in saying something like that? Um yes. I think generally that is that is the supposition because, you know, there's information processing in single-celled organisms that enables them to do what they do to survive, to pick a direction to go into to find food, to habituate to a stimulus, to become sensitized to a stimulus, to solve all the kinds of problems that it does. Now, um, bioelectricity most likely plays an integral aspect to that because a lot of the things that they encounter in their environment can interact with the receptors that are on their bodies. Um, so there are channels that take in ions and they have channels that output ions and that allows them to learn about their environment mm -hmm. and to do all the things that they do. Um, so yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, this is another smaller question and then I might go on to another topic, but I wanted to ask with the RNA, right? What mechanism were they like thinking was working? So these snails that is a slugs, they they slugs. slugs. They um they have DNA, right? That's how they store genetic memory. But but RNA like it works in cells and it like transfers information. I'm not too sure, but what what do they think happens? Like how how would it kind of transfer this sort of learned behavior? Yeah, so this is uh this is a great question. So there's a a distinction to be made between storage and readouts. And uh, the material that might be used to store memory might not be the same thing that is used to read out memory. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, this gets into a lot of uh, complexities because in general, you're born with a genome and that's your DNA. That is your genomic sequence. The analogy I like to make is that DNA is kind of like a recipe, RNA is kind of like ingredients, and protein is kind of like food. Mm -hmm. So your DNA generally doesn't change very much. Like what your genome is doesn't change very much throughout your life. Um, and there, are, of course, there are exceptions to that, like everything in biology. But what I'm trying to get at is that in different cells of your body, different parts of your DNA are activated or inactivated at different times. Hmm. And one way to say that in a single word is that they're expressed. And that is what differentiates a skin cell versus a lung cell versus an eye cell, is that different parts of your DNA are expressed in those different kinds of cells. And uh, when you say that when you mean expressed, you mean that it is that DNA is transcribed into RNA. And then those RNAs are translated into proteins. And proteins are sort of like the actual players in the body. Um, but one really interesting thing that has sort of gained a lot of traction over the past 20 to 30 years is epigenetics. Mm -hmm. So how does all this stuff change over time? And so DNA uh, in the nucleus can be very tightly coiled. And it could also be very, like, loosely unwound. And when DNA is loosely unwound, you have these proteins called transcription factors that bind to that open DNA, which uh, we call chromatin because it's sort of like mm. in this preparation where it's bound up or unwoven. And, you know, there's some other stuff that, you know, we can just glide past. Um, but essentially, different parts of your DNA are going to be tightly coiled. And so they're not 
open to binding by transcription factors, other parts of your DNA are going to be wide open and ready to bind to transcription factors. And those transcription factors initiate transcription of DNA into RNA. And so um, where this where memory comes in, uh, in this one paper from David Glansman's lab where uh, they had these sea slugs where they took RNA from a learned sea slug, gave it to a naive sea slug, and the naive sea slug acted like the trained sea slug. Uh, to block that learned behavioral response, they gave them a drug that inhibits one specific kind of epigenetic event. So an epigenetic event uh, generally happens on the level of DNA. Hmm. So um, like, uh, you know, there are these sort of like modifications that get made to the chromatin, which is the wound up DNA. Um, and how all of these different levels fit together is, you know, a large pool of open questions. Hmm. You know, is there like, are the pivotal parts of the process when DNA gets modified, you know, when it's chromatin by these different epigenetic events? Is it more about when the DNA gets transcribed into RNA? You know, is there a, a is there a protein element to all of this? Um, there are a lot of open questions, um, but there are these different, you know, different levels of biology. There's DNA, RNA, protein, epigenetics, and they all sort of potentially work together, you know, as a storage medium and a readout mechanism for memory. And um, one really cool idea, it's more theoretical, that supports a lot of this is the computational efficiency of DNA. So people have been using DNA um, for storage, you know, in research uh, for like three decades now. And people find that DNA is actually an extremely efficient storage medium. Like people have stored movies on DNA and people have done really phenomenal stuff with that. But um, Randy Gallistel, who I think is at Rutgers University, he's written papers about uh, the comparative computational efficiency between DNA and synapses. And, um, you know, he makes some assumptions and does some pretty cool calculations. But what he shows is that DNA is orders of magnitude more efficient for memory storage than synapses, you know, are. Mm -hmm. um, so so all of that is very interesting. But, yeah, you know, uh, more experiments are definitely needed yeah, to yeah. investigate like this, like macro molecular idea yeah. of storage and readouts, um, because, yeah, it's very fascinating. Yeah. There are a lot of questions. That's that's very helpful. And so okay, I guess we're on the topic here of epigenetics and and I'm right in saying it's like Lamarckian kind of ideas coming back in. Is that right? Um oh, yeah, two great questions. Uh so I'll start with the Lamarck uh, versus uh Darwin kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um generally it's accepted that these sort of units of evolution are genes. Um and uh with epigenetics, people have spent a lot of time debating this issue of epigenetic inheritance. So like, like I was saying how you're born with a genome, that genome uh, 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 mostly doesn't change throughout your life. It's not very dynamic. RNA and protein and epigenetics are very much dynamic. So people have done uh, a lot of work on whether an experience in one organism's life can in any way impact the biological makeup or the behavior of their progeny. So I'll give one example. Um, if a rat is given a very high fat diet during its life, some people claim that that results in their progeny having a higher likelihood of metabolic problems. And people have done sophisticated experiments to look at the um, gametes of rats that are given high fat diets to try and tease out what kinds of epigenetic events might be occurring that are getting transported through the germline to their progeny. A lot of it is very heavily debated, but I think it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy in Israel named uh, Oded uh, Rehavi. 
And he does a lot of this kind of stuff in, I believe, C. elegans or planaria, uh, which are uh, very small uh, worms. I think they're nematodes. And um, uh, where people sort of zoom out on this in terms of Darwin versus Lamarck is really how many generations can this last? So let's just, mm. you know, admit for a second that, you know, a uh, male rat given super high fat diet his whole life, he has some, some baby rats and then those baby rats have metabolic issues. Okay, fine. You know, and let's even admit that uh, there are epigenetic mechanisms that resulted in those problems in the children. The question is, if those children are given a normal standard diet, not a high fat diet, will their children have some of those metabolic deficits from their father's uh, high fat diet during its life? Mm. Um and there's actually a, a good debate on YouTube uh, between Richard Dawkins and Dennis Noble about this. Uh, but, you know, by the end of it, they, they're, they're sort of hammering on this point of like, uh, oh, like how many generations does it last? Because a genetic mutation that um, increases survival and reproduction that is now, you know, evolutionarily selected for and now it's going to basically stick around in the gene pool. So if some kind of epigenetic event happens and it affects the first uh, generation of progeny, does it continue? Um, and I mean, I don't really think that that's necessarily an important criterion for anything. I mean, evolution happens over many generations and all of these things are important. I mean, if genes are still the most basic unit of evolution, wonderful. Um, but if what you experience and do in your life affects the biology of your children, that can manifest in any number of ways. So um, back to the high fat diet example, if a high fat diet, um, a rat on a high fat diet has children with um, with metabolic deficits, who knows how that could manifest in the wild? Maybe they're less likely to reproduce, maybe that can lead to other um, uh, biological problems. Uh -huh. So I feel like all these things sort of coexist. Um, it's not so much of like a uh, perspective battle, so to speak. Um, but I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff to uh, to, to discover there. And um, um, we were saying about pulling cells out of a whole organism and then them sort of doing doing something different than what they were, were originally going to do when they were part of the organism. Um, that is extremely interesting and I think uh, f fertile, fertile stuff right now because like we were saying at the beginning, competencies. What kinds of competencies manifest at different levels of biology? You have an organism, you have a tissue, you have a cell. Uh, and many others in between. But if you take cells from skin or lung or eye or whatever, and then you put them in isolation in a dish with enough nutrients to stay alive, what do they do? Because they were doing something before. They're not just going to stop doing that thing now, um, especially if they're given the nutrients that they need to survive. Right. So um, where what kinds of trajectories that they follow are... Um, certainly able to be manipulated by an experimenter. So if you take skin cells, you put them in a dish and you give them nutrients to stay alive, maybe giving them any number of different drugs at different concentrations can affect them in a multitude of ways. And um, the kinds of things that can be done with cells that are transplanted from whole organisms I think that's a whole like well of open questions and people are doing really wild stuff with um, what they call active matter or smart materials where they're essentially using these not spontaneous, but sort of inherent biological programs to solve different kinds of problems and exhibit different kinds of competencies. Um, but yeah. it gets really, really interesting when you look at things like the Xenobot project. So there you're taking what would be skin cells uh, from frog embryos and you put them in an environment that allows them to grow uh, cilia. Like what I mentioned earlier, these little hair like structures that enable you to move around. So, you know, your skin doesn't move very much. But apparently if you take skin cells from a frog embryo, you put it in the right conditions, 
it gains these structures that allow it to move. And that's wild. That's insane. So it sort of goes to show you that um, what you're born with is not what you're necessarily constrained by. If you're out of that native whole organism form, um, your cells sort of have this space that they can explore in terms of what genes they express, what proteins they synthesize, and how they behave. And the and I think if you can gain organs that allow you to move when typically the organ that you're a part of, the skin, doesn't have these organs mm -hmm. and doesn't move, who knows what other pieces of biology can do that they're not natively doing. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, you get astronomical in the implications and the possibilities. Um, yeah. Do you know what, like, like some of the things they've, they've thought about doing in terms of, like, transplants and, and ways because I, th I think some thought has been done into like biologically what we could do to enhance ourselves uh, and like medical improvements and solving of conditions can you speak to that at all yeah I mean any number of things like when, when you think about what we know about the etiologies of various diseases you might think well gee if I could just control what these cells do then we could fix all these problems. Like um, a lot of people have tinnitus, which is a loss of hair cells in your ear. And you know you have this ringing in your ear, it's very annoying and it's very uh, disturbing. Perhaps you could somehow generate new hair cells or regenerate hair cells in people's ears. Um, cancer is pretty much runaway cell replication. And if you could control cells to stop doing that or somehow enable your body's cells to attack cancer cells so that way you no longer have cancer, that would be incredible. Because, you know, the point is, if you're starting from what's already been done and just picking one example, the one I already mentioned, xenobots, you take skin mm -hmm. cells, you put them in a specific environment, then they grow cilia and now they can swim around and do stuff. Mm hmm. OK, well, so it's doing something that is very much unrelated to what it does natively. Right. What what other non-native things can all cells do? And then when you think about mm -hmm. it like that, you know, it's like you don't know where to draw the line. I mean, there's just too many things to try out. There are too many things to consider. You know, uh -huh. it's like, uh, could you make bone could you make bone fractures heal faster? Could you give people their hearing back? Could you give people their eyesight back? Could you make people process oxygen more efficiently could you make people breathe underwater i mean who the hell knows i see okay awesome and and i just just to thank you for like the, yeah the last like five ten minutes because we were kind of you explained sort of the epigenetics across you know um progeny right over time how does sort of memories and information transfer but then also like across an organism you know can individual cells change so that was really cool and but maybe I, maybe we can switch topics i i I would love to go into some of your thoughts on the process of science, how we do it. You talk about some challenges there. So get into science and meta science, the process of how we change and evolve science so so that we do science itself as a process as most most effectively as possible. Maybe I could start by saying what is meta science and what are some of the biggest problems in science? Absolutely. Um, so meta science is really science about science. How do we use the scientific method to improve the institution of science? Because science uh, is an institution. Science is produced by scientists who normally go through a very structured training process. Science is produced usually in professional and academic journals. It's read by other scientists. It is generally funded by the public, though there is a lot of private industry uh, in science. Um, but really, the goal of meta science is to use the scientific method to improve how we do science and to make science advance more efficiently and to reduce some of the negatives. So um, it's interesting because a lot of the issues that meta science discusses have sort of been discussed for centuries now. So um, the one of the key things that meta science tries to improve is replication. And replication is a pretty simple idea. If I go run an experiment 
you should be able to go run the same experiment and get the same or similar results. And that begs the question, how do you define the same or similar results? And that brings in different statistics like uh, effect sizes and measures of statistical significance like p-values and such. But the point is, is that evidence has sort of accumulated over the past 10, 15 years that a lot of published research across fields doesn't replicate. And so people ask the question, like, you know, this is a problem. Like, you know, the public is spending a lot of money on science. And if that science gets done, it gets published. And then we try to build on it. And then we find out that that original research wasn't actually correct. That's a lot of wasted time, money, resources. So what can we do about that? And so some of the issues that meta science discusses are the incentives of science, the incentives of uh, academic science. So uh, Chris Chambers, who is um, uh, a professor at, I think, the University of Cardiff, he has these really excellent slides where uh, he'll show sort of like the wheel of the scientific method, where it's like observe a phenomenon, come up with a question, develop your question into a hypothesis, go collect some data, analyze your results and report what you found. And so uh, he asked the question, which part of this wheel, which part of this process should a scientist have the least control over? And uh, the answer is the results. Like a scientist chooses what question they ask, they, de they design their own experiment, but they don't have any impact on what the results are. You know, the data are supposed to speak for themselves. Um, and then he asked the question, what part of this process is most essential for having a career in science? And again, the answer is the results. So immediately you see this contradiction that can lead to a lot of problems. So to have a career in science, generally you have to win grant money. And to win grant money, you have to publish papers. And the way that the publishing ecosystem works is to publish a paper, you need to have something exciting to report. You need a positive finding. You have to discover something. And so science is hard. And what happens when researchers do an experiment and their theory isn't supported? They don't get the really exciting positive results that um, they were potentially hoping to get. Well, then the story can get a little bit ugly. So some people, like um, there are cases going on right now with the uh, president of Stanford who just resigned uh, because he was discovered uh, as he was discovered to be producing fraud. He was inventing data out of thin air. He was fabricating data. That is extremely serious. Um, anonymous surveys of scientists show that outright fraud is actually very rare, which is which is wonderful. It's a very good thing. We don't want scientists just inventing numbers out of thin air and then you know publishing based off of it. But what anonymous surveys do show is that this sort of bucket of gray area practices known as questionable research practices or QRPs, some of those are actually very common. So we can talk about what some of those are. One of them is selective reporting. And uh, just to give an idea of what that is, let's say you have a hypothesis, you do 10 experiments to test it, five of them support your hypothesis, five of them don't, great. Write the paper about the five that supported your hypothesis, leave the other five to the side. Um, uh, one is called uh, harking or hypothesizing after results are known. So you have a hypothesis, you run an experiment, you get your results, your hypothesis is not supported. That's okay. I'll just write the paper with a new hypothesis that is supported by the results that I got. And that's very problematic. One, uh, another one, uh, which is uh, sort of well known is a uh, P hacking. So P hacking is sort of um, running lots and lots of analyses on your data. And the ones that give you a statistically significant results, which uh, typically means a P value less than 0 0.05, publish based on that. You know, you publish the findings that are significant, the ones that are not significant, you don't publish. And, uh, it, it's kind of wild because a lot of these problems have been known for decades and decades and sometimes centuries. So 
Um, there's a paper. It's by uh, I forget the first name. I think the last name is Sterling. It came out in like 1959. And he says, uh, you know, it's it's quite worrisome that the literature is filled with so many positive findings because the null findings are not published. And so if somebody does an experiment and the hypothesis is not supported, well, nobody knows that. Mm -hmm. So you might have a whole bunch of experiments that are being repeated by different people because they have no idea that other people already did them and failed. Mm -hmm. Now, it gets even worse than that because by pure chance, somebody might do a failed experiment and get a positive result. You know, that's just normal variation in reality. So if somebody does an experiment that has been done before and been done multiple times before, but didn't pan out, and then they happen to be the, you know, 5% person who gets a positive result, now they might publish that result mm. because you can only publish positive results mostly in the ecosystem in with publication culture. And now that false finding is in the literature and now anybody might decide to build upon it. Um, so all these problems have sort of been known to exist, but only in the past 10 to 15 years have these big, large scale replication projects come out where people will take like 10, 20, 30, 50 studies and they'll replicate all of them. This is across, you know, tens or hundreds of labs, like tons of people pull their resources to replicate experiments from the literature. And they've been done in psychology, economics, uh, cancer biology, you know, a lot of cases. And the numbers are usually pretty dismal. You know, the effect sizes are around half as large as original studies, somewhere around like 20 to 50, sometimes 60% of them are statistically significant in the same direction. Um, there are different ways to assess the quality of a replication, but in general, it doesn't look very good. And so... Now that we have all this empirical data that show that all these perverse incentives actually impact how well a lot of science replicates, people are trying to solve the problem. So um, one example of an institutional measure being taken to fix some of these issues is uh, what's called registered reports. So um, who I mentioned earlier, Chris Chambers, he was sort of like the champion of this um, uh, starting in like 2013 or so. And I think they've been adopted by about 350 journals, but just this year, Nature, which is like the creme de la creme journal, started offering them as a publishing model for um, not all subjects, but I think a few, a few subjects. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially the way it works is, let's say you're the editor of a journal, I'm a scientist. To you, I don't submit a completed study. I submit the idea for a study essentially intro and methods. Mm -hmm. So I'm submitting to you my experimental design, what experiments I'm going to do, what controls I'm going to run, the sample sizes, all this stuff. And then if you, the editor, think it's cool, you give that to peer reviewers, not a completed study, just a, a comprehensive mm -hmm. idea for a study. And then me and the peer reviewers iterate back and forth on uh, the details. Maybe this experiment should be added. Maybe you don't need this experiment. Maybe you need to add this other experimental group, all those sorts of things. But then if me and the peer reviewers come to a consensus, you as the editor give me the scientist what's called in principle acceptance, which means is that as long as I stick to the plan, as long as I do what we agreed on, I'm guaranteed publication. So the results no longer matter publication decisions are now completely disconnected from the quality and character of results, mm -hmm. which is really, really great because now you're removing all of the incentives to selectively report experiments, to p-hack, to hark, you know, all these different things. So that's really important. It's not a panacea. You know, there are many different problems, but I think that that is just one example of like an institutional change that would very quickly better um, the situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding on this, actually. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, Anne Scheel and uh, a couple of other people, they published a side by side comparison of registered reports and regular papers on similar topics in psychology. And they asked the question, what percentage, you know, found support for the hypothesis? Mm 
in the regular papers, 96% because that's generally how science is published. You know, you write your paper as if you had this hypothesis and you found support and we won and it's great and it's awesome. Well, for the registered reports, it was 44% because that might be just what real science looks like. A lot of what we test fails, science is hard. So that's one example. The second example uh, is actually much more dire. So this uh, is related to clinical trials. So in 1997, uh, Congress in the United States passed this law that if you're gonna run a clinical trial, you have to register it on a website called clinicaltrials.gov. You have to register it with the government. What is your clinical trial? Where are you recruiting from? How many people are you going to recruit? What are you going to do to these people? What is the outcome you're going to uh, evaluate success on? All these things. So someone published an analysis, I think in 2015, they looked at clinical trials um, funded by one particular branch of the NIH. It's the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And they looked at trials before the law and after the law. Before the law, 57% of clinical trials were successful. Awesome. After the law went into effect, it was 8%, which shows you that when you have a little bit of regulation and you force scientists to color inside the lines and stick to a pre-declared uh, plan, the success rates drop precipitously, which is extremely scary because that affects you, it affects me, it affects our families and society at large because doctors read these trials and it affects how they treat patients. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, you know, this gets very scary and very personal very quickly. On that last point of the clinical trials, why, why would there be so many like more instances of success when they were sort of not pre-planning is it is it to do with they change their hypothesis and they just they, they 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 find whatever they can find and then they say oh this is what we we're trying to do in the first place is that right generally yes so so okay. they'll change the outcome measure so mm -hmm. um I'll, I'll give an example let's say you're running a trial for an alzheimer's drug and you want to see if a certain drug treats alzheimer's and let's say when you um pre-register your study, you say, um, we're going to do a molecular test and we're going to see if this drug reduces amyloid plaques in the brain because amyloid plaques are considered this, you know, hallmark of Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative disease generally. Now, let's say you run the trial and you see that amyloid plaques didn't change. The drug did not affect them. But let's say that during the trial, you also did cognitive testing on your patients. Let's say you did tests of like memory or decision making or um, uh, numeracy, you know, things like that. And let's say you sort of poke around at your data and you see that the people who got the drug did better on the memory test. OK, fine. We'll just change that to our outcome measure. We'll say that we were looking at the effects of the drug on memory. And now we can claim success when really it's a failure. I see. I see. And in well, fact, uh, there was a study that came out recently that showed that 19% of phase three clinical, tri uh, clinical trials for cancer. So phase three is like the last stage before a drug goes to market. You know, there's phase one, two, and three. Uh, three is usually like, you know, multi-hospital, multi-center, large sample size, you know, big study, millions of dollars to run it, tens of millions sometimes. And they found that 19% um, of phase three cancer clinical trials switch the outcome from the study registration to the publication. Uh -huh. So they'll run the registered trial and the outcome that they register on clinicaltrials.gov, you know, won't be successful. But then when they write the publication of the trial, then they'll switch it out and then they'll usually use something more favorable, which is pretty scary. I see. I've actually asked you about this off the off the air when we last spoke, but would you have to talk about why this is problematic in terms of we can't understand the mechanisms of why things happen if people start changing the hypotheses and they just start reporting only the cool, interesting things that happen instead of instead of just being more systematic about it? Yeah, so this actually gets very philosophical, and uh, people have written that um, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Like, why does the order mm. in which a scientist learns about a significant finding, why does it matter whether they predicted it or not? So, you know, if you just poke around your data and you find something, like, why does that have less mm. relevance than something that you predicted before you even did the study? 
And um, personally, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, one view is that it matters about whether you know anything about the data generating process. So let me unpack that a little bit. Let's say I flip a coin and I claim that the coin is fair. And then you flip it like a hundred times, maybe it'll be like 48 heads and 52 tails, or maybe it'll be exactly 50, 50, but let's just say the coin ends up being fair. Well, you're sort of going into that knowing something about coins. Coins mm. come from a mint. They're not made to be biased in any way. You generally know how coins work. Mm -hmm. Like we know enough about coins to know that they're generally not supposed to be biased. Right. Now, when you're when you get into biology where we know very little about a lot of things, your assumptions really matter. And so uh, this actually gets to something um, written by uh, Ronald Fisher, who sort of developed a lot of these statistical tests that we use. So in virtually every field, people, people use a statistical significance threshold of 0 0.05. If your p-value is below 0 0.05, that's a statistically significant finding. And one thing that he wrote is that what a p-value of less than 0 0.05 means is that you should repeat the experiment. Hmm. And um, one problem is when somebody has a significant finding, they sort of take that and they say, this is now a true fact about reality. Mm -hmm. When even the person who developed a lot of the statistical framing of these tests say, no, it should, you should flag that as something to be repeated, mm -hmm. to check on. And then if you can repeat it, then you can believe it. Um, yeah. But I think in general, um, the problems come in when you start uh, excluding what you report. So getting back to the Alzheimer's example, if you write your publication saying that your drug improved memory when you were initially testing whether it reduced amyloid plaques, and then you don't include the amyloid plaques piece when you write your paper, that's a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I mean, let's just give the extreme case. You run the trial hoping the drug will reduce amyloid plaques or testing whether the drug will reduce amyloid plaques. It doesn't. And then you poke around your data, find that it improves memory. You write your paper on memory and memory only. Now you've done two things. You've switched your outcome and you've selectively reported. So these things compound very quickly and all of them increase the false positive rate. It increases the chance that it's a fluke result that's not going to replicate because um, a critical reader, if they read, oh, drug improves memory, interesting, contrast that with drug improves memory in a trial that was originally set up to see if the drug reduces amyloid plaques and it doesn't. That's mm -hmm. a much different story that you're getting. I see. I see. And, but, but, but you can see how all these different uh, questionable research practices sort of compound to not only distort the image of the science as it's presented to other scientists and the public, but you're really increasing the probability that it's not going to replicate. I see. It's like to me, I don't know if this is right. It just almost seems like science can often be kind of like less structured and more like just trying to find cool things. And now if we try and make some of the changes you suggest, it's almost becoming more just scientific and structured rather than than people sort of going and um, just sort of testing stuff out. Um, right. OK. Um, well, th 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 there's something to say about that. So this is actually um, a, a very common criticism made of of, of registered reports. And um, the very simple answer to that is that when people write registered reports, they still do exploratory analysis and exploratory experiments. Mm -hmm. All they do is they put it in a separate result section. Uh -huh. So you have one result section for all the stuff that you declared with the journal before doing the study, 
And then next to it, you have all the experiments and analyses that you didn't uh, pre-register with the journal. And all of that is 100% okay. The important thing is that you're separating them. So you know what was done after the study, just poking around the data, and what you went into the study predicting. Uh huh. I see, I see. I guess this might be a related topic I mentioned to you, but I wonder if you could speak to machine learning in in medicine and biology and more more generally like yeah how how we can use computational techniques and and these kinds of things to to learn about biology yeah absolutely um machine learning is a very um polarizing and difficult topic because machine learning is very much about prediction so it's not necessarily about explanation. Mm -hmm. People are doing very good work to take machine learning models and derive explanation from them, but it's really not what they're constructed for most of the time. So we can take a very simple example. Let's say you have a machine learning model that is built to classify pictures of cats and dogs. You give it, you know, you give it a picture and it'll output some probability or other confidence score. This is a picture of a cat or this is a picture of a dog. Great. Um, some people make the claim that the structure of a machine learning model that can make that classification accurately is intimately related to how humans make classifications of those kinds. And some people would mm -hmm. definitely disagree with me, but I think that that's very misguided. Um, I think some people try to um, find this mapping or relationship between the internal structure of the brain and the internal structure of neural networks, which are the machine learning models that are, you know, very widely studied today. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's kind of misguided. Um, I, I, I don't really see the similarities there. Um, but, it, but nevertheless, I mean, they are very useful. They just have a lot of pitfalls. So in medical machine learning, a lot of the most advanced work is done um, in imaging related uh, contexts. So things like pathology or x-rays. And people often use these use models for diagnostic purposes. So one of the conditions that had a lot of really early work and uh, a lot of current work as well is diabetic retinopathy. So Essentially, you take a retinal scan of a patient's eye and you use a machine learning model to look at the scan and determine whether this patient has diabetic retinopathy or is at risk of diabetic retinopathy, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And the thing is, is that while a lot of these models can be very accurate in making these diagnoses, what happens a very large percentage of the time is it'll do super well in one study or one clinical trial, and then they'll implement it in a hospital and it'll fail miserably. It won't generalize. And generalization is really the limiting factor to using machine learning, not only in medicine, but in a whole bunch of other contexts. The fact is, is you have a training data set that you use to train and optimize your model. And then when you set that model out into the real world, oftentimes it encounters things that are very different from what it was trained on. And so it doesn't generalize and mm -hmm. the performance suffers. In fact, there was one very funny story where I think um, somebody was doing some kind of neuroimaging with like uh, PET scans or MRIs or whatever. And, you know, the model was performing super, super well. And then they um, tested on either a different hospital's data set or something like that. 
and it failed miserably. And it turned out that all the data it was trained on had some kind of watermark in the frame. It was like the logo of like the scanner or the hospital mm -hmm. or, or just, you know, something like that. Sometimes lighting conditions can impact these things. Right. You know, the lighting in the room where the data, where the scans are done or where the data are collected. Generalization is the canonical problem of machine learning. Um, and generalization is... Um, very much related to overfitting. Overfitting is when a model is trained on a data set and it's predicting so well on that data set and has such a good handle on that data set. But when you give it other data that it hasn't seen before, it fails miserably. You know, that's known as out of distribution. So that new data is out of the distribution that it was trained on. And so it doesn't know what to do with it. And one of the reasons why this is so difficult is because these models are very much black box. We don't really know very well what's going on inside of them. So we don't have a good explanation of why they are able to make accurate predictions when they are accurate. And we don't um, have much of a theoretical basis for knowing why they fail when they see data out of distribution. We just know behaviorally that they do because we see the performance metrics plummet. I see. In a way, this makes me think that some of the problems with them are similar to the problems of like science in general, you suggested of, of it's hard to know mechanisms with um, machine learning. You know, because I think in, in economics, there's kind of been like an obsession with causality and like we really want to use fancy like econometric techniques to find out exactly what's going on because economics can be more fuzzy and so economists can be kind of skeptical of machine learning of like oh yeah we can find out loads of really cool things like hey look we just run huge amounts of data we can we see these correlations but then we don't know why why it's going going on um well i guess this makes you think of a question like in biology this is something i always think of like I'm trying to like grasp the scale of its complexity. Like when we think about mechanisms in biology, like how 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 easy is it to like find mechanisms? You talked about how with like the DNA and the RNA thing, it's like there are many different ones, and so it's hard to kind of discriminate. I don't know, maybe that's maybe a too broad a question, but I don't know if you can say anything to that. Oh, absolutely! It's it's a, it's a great question, and in fact, uh, the word mechanism is such a difficult word. And uh, there's a really good paper by uh, Daniel Nicholson, who's a philosopher of science at um, either Georgetown or George Washington. They're both in DC. I always get them mixed up. But he has a whole paper about different uses of the word mechanism. Mm. And uh, it, it's an excellent paper. I don't remember. Um, I read it year, uh, a couple of years ago. I, I can't remember exactly all the details of it. Um, but Two of the usages of mechanism that he contrasts is a mechanism is simply a set, a sequence of events that reliably follow each other after some kind of intervention. So let's say, you know, I have a bacterial infection, I take some antibiotics, the bacterial infection goes away. Now, the mechanism uh, might not be super laid out. Maybe we know that the antibiotic, um, uses specific mechanisms in my body to destroy the bacteria. You know, how does it destroy bacteria and not um, other cells, even though antibiotics generally damage the microbiome, but we can, we can ignore that. The point is, is that reliably people get bacterial infections, they take antibiotics and the bacterial infections go away. Mm -hmm. So that is one kind of mechanism. It's a reliable sequence of events that can be initiated by taking some action. Now, I think most people would say, well, that's not what I really mean by mechanism. When I talk about mechanism, I want to hear about like the ultra tiny microscopic, nanoscopic, Planck level events right. that happen that scale up and like actually make the thing that I'm interested in happy or happen. Sorry. Yeah. Um, now that. I think most people um, uh, may understand that, at least scientists, that we're in the we're in the dark about a lot of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are conferences about what a particle is. Right. So if people are going to debate and do experiments and pontificate about what a particle is, we might not have a perfect causal mechanistic understanding of anything.
Um, and, you know, I am certainly I am not well versed in, in quantum mechanics and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But trying to get at like a base level of causation and mechanism for anything, not just biology, can leave a lot to be desired. You mm -hmm. might never get there. You have to pick some scale which you are satisfied by in terms of what we started with, a reliable sequence of events. So, you know, uh, as an example, people do really cool experiments in neuroscience with this technique called optogenetics, where you basically express an artificial receptor in specific neurons that can be activated by light. So you shoot a laser at these cells and only these cells that have the artificial receptor will be activated or in some cases deactivated. Mm -hmm. And you can study, you know, what having the ultra precise spatio-temporal control of these cells does to behavior. There was a wild study a few years ago where people did this in uh, neurons in the central amygdala, and they would just immediately turn the mouse into a predator. Like they would have this little like robotic thing sort of like walking around the cage. You activate these neurons, bam, it just jumps on it. It just, you know, it goes right after it. They even made the mice engage in, in what's called a uh, fictive eating. This is really weird stuff. The mouse puts its paws to its uh, mouth and it like acts like it's eating, even though it has nothing in its paws. It's mm. not eating anything. That's why it's fictive. So let's think about the causation of that. So is it the activity at the receptors and the voltage changes in the neurons and the action potentials being fired from those neurons that are causing this behavior? Is there some smaller scale attribute of the ions going in and out of the neurons that lead to that behavior? Is there a certain number of neurons that you would need to have activated before they would go in the behavior? Maybe, you know, if it's 4,900 neurons, they do it. And if it's 4,899, they don't. I see. Um, is there something, you know, nanoscopic about this? I mean, if you zoom into a neuron all the way and you look at quarks and leptons and whoever, you know, who, who knows what else, is there something at that scale that's mm -hmm. actually determining okay. the reliable sequence of events that you care about? And I think from there, you sort of have to have humility about what you can measure, what you can perturb, and you have to just be satisfied with that because you can't measure everything all the time at high resolution. I see. That's interesting because with optogenetics, you think that you're doing a specific thing. You're shining like this light and we, we know where we're putting it. But then even then, that's still difficult to, to find the mechanism. And like, like with that, it makes me think then, yeah, of economics and how I, I seem to think that our biology knows more of the mechanisms. And, but like in reality, it's actually such a, a complex system that it's, it can be kind of hard to, yeah, you know, it's funny you mean by like, you know, the paper and what we mean by mechanism. Because I remember I would study chemistry and I would love like knowing, oh, I'm, the, the molecules, they, they smash into each other exactly in this angle and they make this molecule, which is fine and all. But then you realize like there are multiple ways that can make the molecule. And maybe you can only, it's only relevant to look at it at like the statistical meta level of the, the overall general equilibrium of the reaction rather than like specific. Anyway, um, so, well, go on. You want to say something? Oh, I was going to say, I mean, because uh, uh, econometrics, I think, actually has a lot to say about these things, you know, in terms of, of you know, um, getting at causal inference. And there's um, a professor at a UPenn, uh, Conrad Kurting, who has a lot of really good work on um, trying to bring concepts of causal inference and experimental design from econometrics into neuroscience. Mm. Um, so things like uh, regression discontinuity designs and mm -hmm. um, other methods like that and like trying to disentangle neuronal uh, activity and firing and how neurons cause events in other neurons because um, uh, he has this really great paper about these sort of uh, misleading causal statements that people make. So for example, in neuroimaging, uh, specifically in fMRI, which measures blood oxygenation, there's this term that is very frequently used called functional connectivity. 
and functional connectivity is essentially a correlation. It's a correlation, you know, between uh, an area's, a brain area's blood oxygenation and a behavior, or it might be a correlation between, uh, sorry, it, not a correlation between blood oxygenation and behavior. It's the correlation between two brain regions and their blood oxygenation. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, your hippocampus's blood oxygenation is correlated with your uh, occipital, occipital cortex's uh, blood oxygenation, uh -huh. you might call that functionally connected. It's a correlation. You know, there's nothing, there's not necessarily anything connective or functional about it, but there are these different phrases that people use like functional connectivity or information flow or uh, dynamic causal modeling. And a lot of these things really, when you get down to it, are associational. They're not really causal in any way. Mm -hmm. It's data and statistics being applied to that data to try and claim causality when it really isn't. And when it comes to um, some of the more high resolution neuroscience techniques like electrophysiology or optical imaging, where you're measuring activity at single cell resolution and you might be measuring you know hundreds or thousands of neurons simultaneously if you're doing that in a mouse or a rat or a person there are billions upon billions of neurons that you're not recording from mm -hmm. so uh what this is is massive unobserved confounding because mm -hmm. if you're measuring point, you know, one percent, you know, it's it's definitely well below one percent. But even if you're measuring one percent of the neurons in the brain, you're not going to get a causality. Mm -hmm. I mean, how could you ever make a causal statement like that when you're not measuring ninety nine percent of the cells of mm -hmm. the neurons? So, um, uh, you know, this is very problematic for neuroscience. Um, and, you know, people don't really know how to get around this and like, but um, uh, uh, ideas from econometrics, you know, I think might yeah. play a really cool role in it because of um, how you can design experiments in a potentially better way to sort of move away from pure association and into something like a causal inference, you know, directed acyclic graph sort of uh, framing. I see. I'm going to end the, the podcast soonish um, because um, my only light was the sun and uh, I thought it would last longer. <laughs> I don't have any, but um, uh, I would, I have like more specific biology questions, but I'm going to keep it on this topic as we wrap it up. Um, I'm, I wonder what like new sort of innovations in say, like with, with lang large language models and like chat GPT, like if that in machine learning, like if that's changing anything at the moment, like in the way you talked about machine learning, it was more about, like the actual data. Um, I don't know if you know much about as well the neural network side of actually trying to model, say, neurons. And anyway, just any further thing to say on these kind of new things. Yeah. Um, I think like using machine learning and applying machine learning and, you know, that that's all cool. I, I think where a lot of neuroscientists um, go wrong is trying to act like brains implement neural networks. I'm sure there is some overlap. I'm sure that there are things in the brain being optimized for that have been optimized by evolution and things like that, the same way that a neural network is optimized as it gets trained on data. But I wonder how deep those relationships run, like convolutional neural networks, um, which are mainly used for image recognition. You know, there's this term that a lot of people use, brain inspired. It's inspired by the brain. But the similarities mm. between the visual stream or the visual cortex and convolutional neural networks are pretty superficial. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you're not trying to engage in this um, claim, that the brain is doing something like what neural networks are doing, and you're just talking about whether neural networks can be used for interesting things, I'm all for it. I love technology. I love bulldozers. You know, that's all fantastic. Um, now, large language models are interesting because 
they can be helpful for a lot of things. You know, they're a good, they're good at synthesizing information. You can ask it questions and, and sometimes get relevant answers. Um, sometimes you get very irrelevant answers. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a lot long, large period where they were um, citing references that didn't exist or things like that. Right. They're very much a product of the data that they're trained on. And I think this is where a lot of Gary Marcus's ideas are very important. So Gary Marcus is a, an AI research. Uh, well, he's really a cognitive psychologist, but he's also an AI researcher. Um, and he talks about how what the future of AI might be is sort of a blend between old and current approaches. So in the 80s, people built these things called expert systems, where they would try to concretely build out a decision tree for every situation in some domain. Like you might sit down with like a hundred doctors and you might say, in this situation, what would you do? In this situation, what would you do? And try to map out every contingency and every situation and all that sort of thing. That breaks down very quickly. Life is too complicated for that. Totally. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side of that is what we see today. This sort of just throw oceans of data at it, let it learn the structure and let it figure out how to solve the problem. Mm. But we know that that's very unstable because when they encounter data that's not in the training set and is a little bit different, they don't generalize. Right. So blending those two approaches where you have this very you know data hungry, just throw data at it, but with some... Uh, clear constraints in maybe what gets prioritized, having certain um, alarms on specific situations that might matter. It's so like with a self-driving car, don't run a stop sign. Don't uh, go on the sidewalk. You know, that's not necessarily built into a neural network. You know, they might just, I don't know what Tesla does, but, you know, they have all this like 360 video stuff that they train their models on. And they might just be saying like, you know, this is good driving. This is bad driving. I see. But that, but say, but just labeling something bad and hoping that it learns a pattern yeah. in the data of what bad is or what good is is not really as clear as don't hit the girl on the tricycle on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So you know, yeah, you know, there are a lot of open questions, and, and I, I do think that I do think the technology is pretty far away. I don't think we're going to have self driving cars for at least another five or ten years. Mm -hmm. um, because of these, one, the lack of interpretability, and two, just the general instability of encountering data that it hasn't been that they haven't been uh -huh. trained on. I see. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, well, before I give you like the final word and like people can like learn more about you, I just I was wondering if maybe you couldn't say it now, but I was wondering if you have other like maybe lesser known scientists because I've been writing down the ones that you've mentioned, but just scientists you think like would be interesting to interview or or podcast with that you know that you kind of know of uh yeah definitely um give me a moment to think about that yeah or you so could what... you, or you could oh yeah I can, I can tell you what i'm interested in but you could also like do it like you know like talk to me or email me or something later if you want to think about it but um yeah but i guess what i'm interested i mean i mean i'm interested in the topics we talk about i'm interested as well i didn't really get to ask about it but i'm interested as well in if if there's sort of problem solving and complexity across you know from cells to multicellular organisms i'm wondering about like cultural across you know humans and like um sort of even memetics and like you know things like that um so yeah like it, it, honestly it, it, i'm not a biologist but i don't know for some reason any, everything like the biology the brain or you know uh memory cognition i'm interested in um so uh Names of people, I'll definitely talk to you about that offline. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, of uh, problem solving capacities, and I, I guess you're asking, like, you know, where does that scale to? Like, mm -hmm. in terms of culture and language and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, that I think a lot of those things really might be human only. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a linguist, but I think. Um, I think the consensus is that really only humans have language and it might be that only humans have um, only humans can, can ponder how the world and their species will be billions of years from now. I think some animals have culture. Like I think, 
elephants and other species bury their dead hmm. and they mourn. And I think that is extremely interesting stuff and like primate tool usage and things like mm. that. That's extremely fascinating. Um, and, you know, you got to ask, how did that happen? Why was that evolutionarily selected for, you know, is that kind of like a byproduct? Like, mm. does it, uh, how does burying your dead and mourning your dead improve inclusive genetic fitness mm -hmm. that's sort of the key question there um but uh it's you know it's very interesting it's not stuff that i know very much about yeah, um true. but uh uh yeah <laughs> yeah awesome uh i appreciate yeah i appreciate it. and i just have to say yeah you um really explain and like are able to sort of like divulge loads of cool information really well so honestly it's um it's been really really wonderful um so uh, awesome any, any last words or or where people can sort of contact you or find you uh sure um so i'm on twitter it's just uh randall j ellis uh on twitter and uh that's pretty much the only place on the internet where i am but um okay. i really appreciated talking to you today it was really fun um and uh, i love talking about these topics and i'm really happy that we got to do this and i appreciate it okay awesome well thank you awesome.